So today, in the list of things that matter most is the phrase, can I help? Not too many years ago, Reva and I, with our children, were on a pulpit exchange uh, in London and surrounding community. We took a little excursion for about three or four days, made our way into Paris, and found ourselves in the depths of the subway system in Paris, France. And we were lost. And we had been told that the French, especially in and around Paris, are not very friendly or helpful, especially if you do not speak their language. I took French in high school and college, but I'm telling you, I didn't learn it very well. And so finding our way out of that subway and whether to go this way or that way and which one to, of the, of the uh, trains to catch was troubling. When Finally, a little lady walking came up to us and said, can I help you? In a very broken English. And we explained that we didn't know where to go and we indicated what we were looking for and she said, go this way. She pointed, take this train. You know, it changed my whole perspective of what someone had told me, Matt, about the people of France. In the story that uh, John read today is one of the most well-known stories of someone being helped. We call this parable the parable of the Good Samaritan. And it comes to us because there is a person in the audience listening to Jesus teach who wants to qualify who it is he should help. He's not doubting that the greatest of all commandments is to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. He just wants to clarify who is my neighbor to which Jesus tells this story. Why is it? Why is it that we're more likely to say, can I help you to some people than we are to others? Two ladies came home from a, a little excursion a number of years ago in a, another church where I served and were so excited at the door to tell me this story. They said, Pastor, our car failed us on the freeway uh, outside this large city and we had uh, this was prior to cell phones being uh, popular and she said we were really stranded and looking in my rearview mirror I noticed two large burly looking gentlemen pulled up behind us on big old motorcycles and I was scared to death because all my life I've believed that those guys on motorcycles were rough and tough and not too nice. But one of them got off of his motorcycle and came up and, and pecked on my window. And when I rolled it down, they said, you're having trouble? Can we help? And they helped us get someone to tow our car. They helped us to not be fearful of the traffic flying by us on the freeway. And I'm telling you, Pastor, never again will I have a preconceived idea of a group of people. The problem with this phrase, can I help you, is that we pick and choose who it applies to. The parable of the Good Samaritan is a marvelous story because it reminds us all that there, are, there is a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, which, by the way, did you know that that's one of the most treacherous roads in ancient history? That people were robbed and beaten and left for dead on that road all the time. And it was a road that you were never supposed to travel alone. So in reality, most scholars agree that you could very well make a case stating that this person who was beaten and robbed and left half dead brought it on himself by traveling alone. In fact, you could almost make a case in many situations for the people who are in trouble and need a little helping hand have contributed to the trouble they're in. But we are reluctant to help people unless they're totally innocent of their circumstances. So the, the man who was beaten and robbed brought it on himself. The story goes on to say that a priest came by and passed by. You do know the reason the priest would have passed by. The idea that a man is almost dead in Jewish uh, law would have made the priest unclean. 
The Bible teaches in the Old Testament in Leviticus and Deuteronomy that any time a person comes in contact with blood or a dead body, they have to go through the ritual of pur purification, which takes several days and several sacrifices in order to renew their purification so that they could enter into the temple. If this is correct, and I know that it is, then the priest is most likely avoiding this person who's injured for sake of, of, of sanctuary purity. The, the Levite is also passing by on the other side, and we understand from history that one of the phrases that the Levites believed in is, safety first, never take a risk. Now, if those are the qualifications to be a priest and a Levite, then tell me something. Who are the people that you're most likely to help? Only the people you know and only the people you consider it to be safe to help. I don't believe that the parable of the Good Samaritan for our hearing today is a reminder to us. Now look, folks, when you leave here today, you be careful out there. Don't you go up to anybody that you don't know and ask them if you can help because it could be trouble for you. I don't think that's what this parable is about. So why do we not respond? Why are we sometimes more like the Levite, more like the priest than we are like the Samaritan? I'd like to offer some suggestions. Number one, I think the reason is, is that a little bit, if we're honest with ourselves, we're just a little bit selfish because we're focused on what we've got to get done and we just don't have time to deal with someone else's problem at this moment. Another reason that we might not want to say, can I help, is that sometimes we're a little bit afraid. We're a little bit afraid of what we might get sucked into. But the third and the most significant reason I believe that we don't say to people, can I help, is that we feel inadequate to many tasks. Sometimes you don't have to know how to fix the situation. You just have to be able to say, well, here's some possibilities of people and maybe I can help you and I'll, I'll call ahead and let them know that you might be coming by to see them. There are simple little things that we can do to help people. And I want you to know that there's a part of this story of the, of the Good Samaritan that gets overlooked. By the way, did you know that when Jesus told this story of the Good Samaritan, about the priest passing by, about the Levi passing by, and he said, and then a Samaritan comes by. Did you know that when he made that phrase, probably 90% of the people in the crowd began to say, okay, now the real villain has shown up. They're probably thinking he's going to rob them again and take whatever else the thieves left behind. The, the people that Jesus taught and spoke with in the day and time that he lived despised the Samaritans. They were considered to be less than human. But Jesus says, the Samaritan went to this man. He bound up his wounds. He put him on his own donkey. He took him to the inn. He took out his money. He gave it to the innkeeper, and he said, take care of this man, and after, uh, when I return, I will pay you whatever you are due. If we're not real, real careful... We can, lose, we can lose our sense of good in humanity. I want you to know that when you help someone else, it restores their sense of good in humanity. It restores it to them. I want you to know that, that today, when you leave this place, you might meet someone who's really down on their luck, really struggling, and they need to know that somebody cares. I'm telling you, it's not the big things that we do. It's sometimes the little simple things that you can do. A smile, a warm greeting, and also just a saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what you're going through. Pick up the phone today. Write a note. Send a text message. If you know of somebody who's going through a really tough time in their life, send them something that will help them. Be that agent of hope and renewal in someone else's life. 